So it's simple, so to have fun. You're asking how? Well, it's rather straightforward after you learn the absolute easiest way to sew. Welcome to my third program on this series, and that's just what I'm going to do, show you techniques that are easy to sew. Pockets are my first focus for this episode. Clever use of household tape will give you the guide to sew the outright simplest mitered corner. The absolute easiest way to sew. That's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, making a difference in sewing, quilting, crafting, and needle arts for over 30 years. Amazing designs and Class A needles. On this jacket, the pocket has a very sharp miter, not created by folding the corner to get it sharp, but by stitching on the wrong side. We can follow this jacket up to the collar, and this is a single layer jacket, where the miter is this, done the same way on the lapel. So you'll have many ways or areas that you can apply this technique. First of all, interfacing. You need to add fusible interfacing to the pocket, and I prefer to full fuse, which means basically fuse the whole size. But because the pocket is going to has a hem allowance, you can see in the one that I've already done that I split the interfacing just by cutting it before I fused it on. There's a one inch hem allowed in this pattern, and I would just cut off one inch, separate it at the one inch, and then cut a, oh, just a sliver of the interfacing away so that when we fuse it into place that it will definitely cause a definite break, an easy break for the fabric to fold. Now with fusible interfacing, I like to choose a weight that's one weight lighter than the fashion fabric, not too heavy because you just want it to add shaping. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. They'll vary slightly but usually involves a lot of steam, heat, and some time. And what I'm not supposed to be doing is press, ironing, but rather pressing to hold it down. So those are the techniques that you use for fusing the interfacing to place and then leaving a space so that you have definitely a place where it will fold back easily. Now, that's kind of a side note. The important part is mitering that corner. The seam allowances in this particular pattern are 5 eighths of an inch, pretty traditional garment sewing. You're going to double the seam allowance measurement, so double 5 eighths is an inch and a fourth, and you'll see why in a minute. And I'm going to measure that inch and a fourth at each corner, each of the lower corners where the pocket will be mitered. And you do the same on the other corner. And then I mentioned household tape. Get some tape and cut it longer than you think you may need and extend it from the wrong side from the inch and a fourth mark to the inch and a fourth mark. Then fold the fabric in half meeting right sides. Start at the point where I am right now. Fold it in half. There we go. And then align the edges and the pieces of tape and stitch along the tape. And here's a close-up of me sewing right along that tape, making sure that the fabrics have been aligned properly. And here's one that has been sewn. You can see I stitched along that area. Truth be told, what it takes most to do, or the longest to do in this, is to remove the tape. So remove that tape, then trim off the excess fabric, I usually now finger press, just crease it a little bit, and then turn this to the inside so that the right side forms a miter, just like that. So that you would do the same on the other pocket. If you can possibly see if I get it lined up there, it, it's like a picture frame or 
doing woodworking and mitering a corner on woodwork. And on this particular pocket, both of them are mitered and all those bulk from the seam allowance is gone. You know, traditionally when you do this on a pattern, oftentimes they'll just ask you to fold the fabric once, fold it twice, but then you have a lot of bulk in here. Let me just show do it. You get bulk and you have this raw edge. You don't have it this way by mitering that corner. Not all pockets have mitered corners, some are rounded. So if you have that, I'll show you some tips on rounding the corners. On this particular fabric, I did the same split of the interfacing. And then to press a corner, you can use a pressing shape. And this has 5 eighths of an inch seam allowances. So I'm going to align this. And I'm just going to move it a little bit closer to my work. And on this gauge, I can align the edge to 5 eighths. First, I'll do this edge, get a little bit of steam. Then the other edge, I'll go this way. And then you can kind of mold around here and mold it around. And this tool can use a tool to kind of be your fingers so that you're not going to get pressed where you don't want to have pressing done. So from the right side, then you can get the other corner identical to the size because you've used a shape comparably formed to shape on the other side. So you can either sew in a miter, press in the shape, and I'd trim out some of that fabric. I'd trim out some of this extra fabric, of course, but then you get the, the pockets shaped and pressed perfectly before you top stitch them onto your finished garment. Much of what makes sewing easy isn't visible from the outside. Case in point, the facing. Around the neckline of this dress, a facing quietly finishes the edges and provides shape without making an announcement. Yet done incorrectly, it would make the wrong kind of statement. Here's a simple yet sure way of sewing the absolute easiest facing. You just saw the close-up of this dress uh, that has the facing around the neckline, has a zipper finish which will be detailing a little bit later, but from the wrong side, really there's no evidence of it on, other than it's a nice soft finished shape. I'll give you some hints about working with this on the facing. The facing pieces are cut about three inches wide and the, there's usually pattern shapes, uh, always pattern shapes I should say, that, that come with your pattern that are shaped the size, the shape of the armhole or neckline. And these are two facings for an armhole, a circular armhole area. And I have fusible interfacing cut the same size as the facing pieces. Now when choosing interfacing, just make certain it's not too heavy. You wanna make sure it's drapeable because it's going to add some weight to your fabric. You want it to give it shape, but not to make it a suit of armor. So lightweight, and then follow the instructions and then do the pressing, not ironing, to place it in shape. And I usually cover it with a press cloth so that in case the iron is too hot or whatever and you get the idea. I Here we got some steam and press. And you're going to be pressing a little bit longer than I am taking time right now to fuse it into place. Then with right sides meeting you'll be sewing the facings together sewing the underarm and the side seam, and this is for an armhole facing. Pretty simple stitching. The facing is met to the right side of the garment and stitched around the, the armhole. And when sewing in a curve, always sew with short stitch lengths because your sewing curves will be easier to maneuver around these curves. I'm not a real fan of clipping fabrics. I would rather grade, trim the seam allowances different widths. But before I do that, I would recommend to set the seam by pressing flat. Pressing usually takes two steps in my opinion. Press it flat, then press it open or to one side. And since this facing is going to be invisible from the right side, then I press this seam allowance toward, whoop, I got too many layers here, one more time. Press the seam allowance toward the garment, or I should say facing, press it away from the garment. Totally opposite of what I said, so I'm pressing it away. 
it's easier to press on a, on a flat surface than an angled surface. So after it's been pressed, then I do the grading, the trimming, and I always make the facing smaller. The facing seam allowance is smaller. And then the garment seam allowance, just a little bit larger. If you trim properly, you don't need to clip. I think clipping, clipping being clip, 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 that weakens the seam. And I think with proper trimming, I rarely clip. And you're gonna do this all the way around the edge. If you watched our second program of this series, we did understitching. That's to stitch the seam allowance to the facing. And here's a close-up of sewing this understitching, sewing around the armhole, stitching the seam allowance to the facing, and you might guess we have that sample right here where it's been stitched. That will allow that facing, when it's pressed to the underside, to be neat and clean, and that edge is totally finished. One remaining step is to attach the facing to the garment. From the right side, we'll stitch in this ditch, stitch in the groove to hold that facing in place so that when you take it on and off, it doesn't keep on coming out. And here's, a, you can see how that's stitched right in the ditch and it will hold it down. Let's take a close look at that same facing from the right side. This point of interest is now the zipper or more correctly, the zipper pull. To seamlessly, pun intended, sew an invisible zipper into the seam, it is best done after the facing is attached. It's an approach that is rather new and is one of my absolute easiest ways of sewing. Putting a zipper in the back of a dress or a top or even putting a zipper in a skirt, you put the facing on first. It's a little different from the traditional way. Then the, in this instance, invisible zipper is inserted into the seam. On my sample that I have here, we, first of all, let's look at the zipper. It's going to be the invisible zipper that only shows with a tab. Open up the zipper and press. This is probably one of the most important steps. You need to flatten out the coil. It's curled up and flatten it out. It'll make sewing so much easier. So on both sides, push that coil away from the tape and flatten it out. The sample that I have is part is just a partial top as you can see but you're not going to sew the center back seam that's going to be done at the end so leave that whole seam open and finish the neckline with a facing just the whole facing as you can see and it's not attached at the center back so I'll flip that those facing pieces up then in the zipper opening, you'll see some markings. I've marked the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on both sides. Now the zipper goes, is placed right sides together to the garment, and we're going to start on your right side. And you have, you're going to place the majority of the zipper into the garment and align the teeth with the markings, the 5 eighths of an inch markings. Starting at the top, I'm just going to put a pin right at the top of the zipper pull. And that pin is going to be set down just like an eighth of an inch from the finished neckline. Then I will match one side at a time, match the teeth right next to the tape and pin all the way down. And then one more time, pin, and then I'll be ready to do the first stitching and I'll do that at the machine. If this is your first invisible zipper application, when you purchase a zipper next door, you'll find a, a foot that you can purchase. It's generic, can go on almost any sewing machine and has little rollers in the front part of it. And what happens is that the center roller follows in the groove of the zipper teeth. And the teeth fit right to, to the left or right of it, depending which side you're sewing it. Now, just as a kind of a quick review, the top of the zipper where the teeth stop or, or the top stops is offset, recessed down about an eighth of an inch, fourth of an inch from the top so that it's not going to go beyond that seam. And then the teeth are next to the marking, right sides meeting. 
Most of the time, when you put in a zipper, you're going to start from the bottom up, but not this time. You start from the top and sew down to the end of the zipper. You can't go any further because you'll soon see there's the mechanism of the zipper is there. So I got to get this aligned. Give me a second to get it aligned so you can see and get this out of the way. I'm starting at the top seam and the roller is down that groove. Let me just back stitch to anchor it and I make certain that the right sides are meeting. The zipper teeth are along that line. Along the line that I marked. I'll take out the seams. Now I'm getting to the end of the zipper, the short little seven inch zipper and get those two align, the marking align and the teeth and you can see I have to stop. Can't go any further. Back stitch, cut the threads and then as I raise this up I'm going to just do a little check just to make certain that I stitch properly and that the top of the zipper ends just just a little bit. Let's, let me fold that down for you so that it clears the very edge, so it clears that top area. You don't want it to go any further. You need a little hook and eye perhaps, but you can see, you, can, you can't really even see one half of that zipper. Now to put the other half in, you're going to meet right sides together. And when you're on your table, you can make sure your garment is lying flat, meet right sides together, and align then the second half of the zipper so it is at the same distance. And I'll put a pin right there and unzip the zipper and you do the same thing. This time sewing on the opposite side, aligning the teeth to the 5 eighths of an inch line, doing some pinning and I'll get it lined up here and you sew from the top down. Same thing only on the other side, mirror image. On this next sample, it's been stitched. Imagine that, a sample of that stitched. And here in a little different color zipper, but you can see what happens at the top and it's going to be finished almost perfectly. Because the facing is already there, you just fold down the fabric. If you want to do a little trimming in there, you certainly may. And then we'll fold on the other side and hand stitch and then that zipper is complete. So we do some pinning and look at, there you go. The zipper is in there and you can take out the markings from your, from your marking pen. Now, the center lower seam is still open. Keep this foot on and adjust it. Move the foot all the way over to the left so that the needle clears the foot. I'm going to start sewing at the bottom of the seam. Now this is where you sometimes set my machine at loosen the tension so, because I've been known to have to take this seam out. But we'll see what I can do. I'm meeting the cut edges of the fabric below the zipper tape. And here you can see where I've stopped stitching. So now I'll just scoot this underneath the foot area. I have the foot lined up with that last stitching. I'll sink the needle right next to my stitching. Lower the presser foot. And you can see the zipper tape is out of the way. And now just sew the rest of the seam. You can't use a traditional seam or foot, I should say. You have to use the rest of the zip, the, the other part of the zipper foot, and it will work. And I'll see how good I did. And when I lift this up, take a quick look. Oh my goodness, it worked. So here's the rest of the seam. Right here, it's gone continuously from the zipper to the seam allowance. It would require some pressing on the other side, but with some savvy stitching putting on the facing first, marking the zipper placement, pressing the zipper and stitching it in with that crazy foot, you'll have a neatly put in zipper. Book club members are often inquisitive minded. You know the premise, read a book, get together to discuss or debate the topic, and then eat. Not so with a cover to cover book club. They discuss their books through creating quilts. Welcome Diane Kane and Joanne McNaughton, who join us via Skype from Portland, Oregon. Welcome Joanne and Diane. Thank you. Thank you. 
This is a this is a fascinating book club. And Diane, will you give a brief overview of of your group of eleven? Sure. The group started in about. 2000. It was a uh, group of ladies that were quilting together at a local shop and one of them decided we needed to challenge ourselves and work a little harder at this. So they decided they would read a book and then create a quilt that was inspired by the book. There are 11 of us now. Uh, three original members are still with us. We live in the Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, Washington area. We read two books a year, and um, we we feel like we have a really nice, diverse group now. We create a lot of, we all use a lot of different kinds of techniques, and we think that helps create a really interesting show for our viewers. And, and Joanne, the the book that we're going to uh, discuss in via quilts uh, is an interesting title. Could you share that with our viewers, please? Hugo Cabaret. Um, it's a book about a young boy who ends up living in, a, in the railway station in Paris. His father passes away, and it has to do with a clock in gear, a clock in the, in the um, train station and with gears, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's quite a powerful story. Well, this is a perfect transition because the first quilt that we're going to share with our viewers is by your group men member, Linda Reinert, and it's called Gears. So tell us a little bit about this quilt. Linda does a lot of quilts with circles, and so she really wanted to use her circle technique to create this piece. It's a fairly large piece. It displays well. People love mm -hmm. looking at it. Linda's done a great job creating it. She's a master quilter, too, so it's just from up close. It's a beautiful piece of work. Like you said, these are masterfully done. I mean, not little little wall hangings quickly done. This is a real art. Uh, Judith Phelps also did one on called Value of Gears, Joanne. Um, Want to tell us your insights into that quilt? I, I truly in my life have never seen anything as <laughs> masterful as, as Judith's quilts. Um, I believe she draws first and paints, and then it's all stitchery, and it's precise, and it is simply magnificent. Um, it is. And it that is. quilt, I think, is only one-sided. No, of it's two. It's, it's okay, two-sided. It's, two yeah. it's all done with thread, so we always wow. tell people, make sure you look at the back, because the back is just as interesting, interesting as, as the front. front. Oh, my. Diane, your quilt is called Suspended in Time. Yes. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to create a piece that would represent the gears. And we have an opportunity every year, this is this was year number four, to display our quilts at the Sisters Oregon Outdoor Quilt Show. Mm -hmm. So our quilts hang on clotheslines and they move in the wind. And I wanted to create a piece that you would be able to look through. So the black background that you see on the photograph is simply the backdrop for the photograph. When you look at that quilt hanging on the line, you can see through those holes. You have openings. I do, yes. And one of those openings was actually not supposed to be there, but I couldn't get all the pieces in the middle to match, so I thought, oh, I'll just make a hole in it like I did with the others. Great plan. And I loved the effect. And then when I found the clock gears, I knew I really had found the perfect piece to hold all of those nice. circles nice. together. Thank you. Joanne, your quilt is up next. I love the quilt that I made because it makes me think of the times that we have, my husband and I have been able to travel in Europe, and typically the buildings that I portrayed are the kinds of buildings that mm -hmm. I have seen in our travels, and I felt the cafe could fit into that. It, it's lovely. And then our final quilt, and to close our segment from by Pat Butsby, Busby is the invention of Hugo Cabaret. Gave it the same name of the book. Yes. Pat is one of our masters. She mm -hmm. and Joanne are two of the members that have been with us since we started. Mm -hmm. Pat starts by reading the book and then and then she's able to combine all the components and some masterful artwork that she creates and then she builds from that. And that is a huge quilt as well. It's I I'm not sure I mean that would it would certainly cover a full size bed, perhaps even a queen size bed. 
just a stunning piece of work. And it's one of those that you have to just keep coming up and looking mm -hmm. at because sure. each time you look at a different part, you see different things that she's yeah. done. Well, Diane and Joanne, wonderful time to see what variety comes from a book, the inspiration. And I know others will join you in perhaps doing this in their book club. Thanks for joining well, us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us during this three-part series on the absolute easiest way to sew. You can also go to nancyzeman.com and watch many other shows, Rewatch this one, and also join us via social media. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Nancy Zeman has written a fully illustrated book entitled The Absolute Easiest Way to Sew, which includes all the techniques featured in this three-part series. It's $19.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2816. Order item number BK2816, The Absolute Easiest Way to Sew. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at nancyseaman.com to see additional episodes, Nancy's blog, and more. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs and Class A Needles, Closed Captioning Funding provided by Pellon. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.